everyone. Uh, before I start, I propose uh, we all have a clap for the organizers. So that's Agnese, Ofer, Leonardo, and Sasha, who's here, who put together this wonderful conference. <laughs> I understand that the staff was already thanked, but I think we can also have clap for the fantastic staff. <laughs> Loud enough that they can hear us. <laughs> yeah. uh, could it be that you left with the little uh, switch right on your computer? No? It's with, maybe it's here? No? Anyway, so I can do it with a keyboard. So so yeah, so it was a conference on, on, on algebras, and I thought we should have at least one side explicitly on large and operator algebras. <laughs> uh, this is an interesting idea to consider uh, small fluctuations around the classical state. So if you have expectation values at order m, which is like one over h bar, look at small fluctuations, and this gives an interesting way of repackaging the OPE, which is, depends on the state you're expanding around. And a particularly interesting thing is like ocean of identity, which you can think of as two point functions of small fluctuations. And there's a lot of information in that, in, in that object. And, and by decoding it properly, we can understand some things in the bulk. That's closely related to things we call heavy, heavy, light, light correlators and conformal field theory and so on. And this is not what I will discuss today. Uh, instead, We'll be looking at the next term in this expansion. Uh, things like, so one basic claim would be the following, is that if you look at the double trace coefficients in this combinator, which is like a four-point function in the background, in the background state psi, in some interesting corner limit, it's basically encoding some bulk scattering amplitude near the edge of the causal wedge. And if you know this amplitude, they basically reveal the bulk geometry in a very, very straightforward way. No decoding needed. Only one, one message. And so with the outline, so I give some general motivation. Then I describe exactly how, how, what kind of four point correlators we look at, uh, which will have some non, non familiar operator ordering, or orderings. And we'll discuss how we actually compute them. And then I'll show some images of what they look like in some actual states. So, so I think a lot of this is motivated by, the, by this slogan that certain class of holographic CFTs should have some local gravity physics, should be dual to local gravity physics. So this should emerge from the field theory uh, that we have essentially Einstein theory coupled to matter. And this is something that has now become much less mysterious than it was. We understand it rather explicitly for a simple correlator, in particular the stress tensor around the vacuum state. Uh, as was clear from Alex's talk this morning, we should, there are probably ways, interesting ways to refine this criterion and, and, and probably still missing a lot of interesting things there. But it's much less mysterious than it was. But still, we're far from having a full account of the nonlinear theory. How do interesting solutions emerge? And, and here, for example, uh, I have in mind a, you know, one of the early predictions of ADS-CFT was that if you take a certain specific uh, gauge theory, it's strong coupling, you, by solving, by finding a, a, a black hole geometry in the bulk, you can calculate its free energy and all sorts of interesting properties. And I think until like, we can actually do this from CFT language, I, I think we don't really understand how, how, how gravity emerge. So I think that's like the standard we should aim for. And, and in terms of uh, uh, general, general, general things here, so, 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 of course, we kind of have some idea of the, of the uh, uh, how to get the bulk metric from boundary objects. So, for example, if I give you the stress tensor of the boundary by integrating Einstein's equation radially in some preferment gram expansion, you can reconstruct the bulk metric. Uh, it's not quite, but this, this notion of emergence is not really, I think, useful. It's not really in the line of, of what we want to do. 
it's more like a calculation of the metric than like a measurement from, from, the, from the field theory. And I think it, it, the, the distinction becomes very significant if we think about you know, some of the bigger things we would like to use ADS-CFT for. I will not, of course, make any progress on these questions today. But, but like, for example, one of the promise of the ADS-CFT is that the sense of CFT is better defined. It, it should tell us the correct answer in situations where we're not sure what the bulk equation of motion are. So, so it would be nice to understand the bulk without relying on the bulk equation of motion. Right? And, and also, if you're interested in strongly coupled field theories, like one of the promises is that we could say things about specific theories, like QCD, and whose dual are far from evident. And at least, if we not use the graphy, at least we use some ideas from it. And, and I think one, one sort of question here we can ask is, uh, uh, can we at least imagine a tough experiment in QCD that will tell us what the, bound, what the bulk geometry is, or if, if there isn't, like to what extent there isn't? Like what, what, what kind of QCD experiment will, will, will tell us that? So that, that, that's what we like to go, go toward. So here's a bunch of wish lists that the way of thinking about bulk metrics should, should satisfy. And I think, well, ideally it should be based on simple observable, just because if you want to understand something complicated, it, it, it's useful to have a probe that you understand. That's transparent. Uh, in order to do, to generalize this sort of a bootstrap argument that worked for stress tensor correlator that I, I would review shortly, we really need some, something that have a large single. We can't be looking at just some small, some exponentially small single that we amplify. We have to look at some order one measurement. Uh, we would also like to understand, to have a high spatial resolution, we meaning that we really want to understand the metric at, at, at string lengths, much smaller than, than ADS scale, because that's how these holographic theories are supposed to emerge. That's the difference between a random CFT and a holographic one, is that, that you can probe small scales. So, and finally, uh, well, I only want to get the metric when one exists, right? If someone gives me an excited state of the 3D Ising model, I would like a formalism that tells me that I can't give you a metric. <laughs> and, and yeah, so the basic proposal is that four-point functions, which actually do that. It's not going to be, not going to be very, and, and the way, the, the sort of construction we're going to do are not terribly deep or surprising, so it's a bit like, Think about the, 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 the pioneer spacecraft. So we threw a probe into outer space and then we bounced light of it. That, that, that's the basic type of experiments we do here to probe space. <laughs> okay, it's not gonna be really much deeper than that, but uh, I think it's gonna be, yeah, it, it's an interesting thing to, to understand better how to do that from four point functions. So, so, so this is one slide where I try to summarize this somehow bootstrap approach to the stress tensor four-point functions and the results that were obtained in the, in the past year. Uh, just to put some, some context. So, and it's also just to also, let me just step back a bit. I also want to, sorry, I can't switch like this. <laughs> this is just to, to clarify a bit uh, some of these points here. Uh, so, so, for example, one reason we, the fact that we need something that's exponentially small means that, for example, if you think at, about the two-point function of AV operators, in some approximation it's controlled by the geodesic length of some Euclidean geodesic that goes, that's an example of something that, that's not great for us because it's exponentially small signal, and you're, you're looking at a very small correlation, and there's a precise sense that this is not the sort of thing we can, like, productively bootstrap. And and, and so I just want to like to demystify how, how, how this bootstrap work a bit here. And for example, suppose you want to constrain some bulk effective theory. Let's start with Einstein plus some higher derivative corrections. Normally we think of, this, of these corrections as small. And, and yeah, the coefficient here is some power, inverse power of some mass. We expect that this is kind of a gradient expansion that all when the derivatives are, are small. And we're only gonna use that action in that regime. But if you want to actually constrain this action, what you have to do is to actually study scattering experiments 
at the cutoff where it breaks down. <laughs> and that, that, that's what we actually did. And, and, and you and then use energy that are somewhat larger than the cutoff, but still like much less than the Planck scale. And that's the generic re regime we also have in mind today. This is when we do scattering experiments like that. And also we have to probe impact parameters that are close to the cutoff. You have to push it to the limit to, to, to constrain it. And even though the effective theory is broken down above the cutoff, the idea is that we can get some rules which relate what happens at these energies to what we measure at low energies. And the unique thing about gravity is that you can write a sum rule for G Newton. You can't write that for electromagnetism. But for gravity, you can write a sum rule for G Newton. It's because the force grows with energy somehow. And you have some sum rule. And you can also write some rules for all these higher derivative interactions. And, and, and because of dimensional analysis, you get inverse power of, of, of the energy you're looking at, or the scaling dimension of the exchange operator using CFT language. You get some rules that schematically look like that. And the game is to find positive combination of the sum rule for G Newton that dominates the other sum rule. Then you compare them, you get a bound on the higher derivative correction in terms of the energy scale of your energy experiment. So that's how, that's the mechanism by which we get these bounds. But I just want to emphasize that, you know, there's a lot of technical detail involved, but as soon as you have a sum rule for G Newton, you know it's going to work. That, that's really the key thing about, about gravity. You can write down sum rules for G Newton and get results of this, of this type that, that, that really tells you, yeah, that, that, they tell you two things. They tell you that A EFT works up to this higher spin scale. This, this is the dimension of the first higher spin operators. And conversely, they tell you that in any theory of gravity, as soon as gravity becomes modified compared to Einstein, you need a tower of light, you need a tower of higher spin particle to appear. These things are correlated. So without further ado, let me start talking about how we probe the bulk with excited states, an arbitrary excited state with, uh, with four-point functions. So, so we're going to construct the operator as follows. So, so the, the first step is going to have some energetic, energetic excitation in the bulk of this. And let's say we want to measure the energy density. So it's like a question you can ask like in undergraduate quantum mechanics, like write down an operator that does this experiment. Okay? You cannot, in undergrad, you cannot measure it, but you should at least be able to formulate the problem, right? And, and the basic answer is this, right? So you start from your state, you say, well, you want to add an excitation, well, okay, you act with O. And if it should be an ex, an in the energetic excitation, then, it's reasonable to put some, integrate against some wave packet that has high frequency and relatively localized. Okay, so that's our excited state. And then you take an expectation value of stress tensor in that state. Okay. So that gives this object, which is a three point function. Three point function because you have to square that excited state. Okay. And yeah, these sort of things have been, have been studied before. And, and the important thing to notice is the operator ordering, which, which is the one that would be familiar to you in the undergraduate quantum mechanics class, but it's not the one uh, before you learn to do time ordering in quantum field theory. Like it, it's, very, it's not time order. And it's important here. So, so what happens here? So, so, so you create this operator O here, and then, and then in, in the cat, and then in the brow you also have this other O, and then you do the measurement later. And a useful way to think about those pictures here is to imagine you have a time fold. And, and, and instead of involving the bra forward in time, you can also imagine that you have a particle that starts from, from, from O, goes forward, and then moves back on the complex conjugate amplitude. Okay, it's the same picture, it's just different ways of thinking about it. So you end up drawing a picture like this. The Feynman diagram kind of looks like this. So you have some, some propagator that goes one way and then it goes back. Okay. And, and you can like, glue it wherever you want in the future, it doesn't matter as long as you go outside the past like cone of your measurement. But it doesn't matter, it doesn't, it's not going to influence your measurement. Okay. So we can we think of this calculation like this, so I'm just introducing notation effectively for this sort of time forward. 
So you see that I'm, I'm drawing I'm drawing a space-time picture where you the time fold is kind of yeah, there's a reminiscence of the time fold. So we, so that that's formally how we define these things. And it's important that orders are not next to each other because if I if I move the O here to the first branch, then I'm going to create it and absorb it, and it's never going to measure anything, right? It, it's very important that the order that the T is between the, <laughs> the O's. <laughs> So, so what do we measure when, what do we see when we measure this? Well, if we put a wave packet that has a momentum that's time-like and large, it cannot really create extensions in the boundary, but instead it can resonate with extension in the bulk. And it's basically going to create a fast particle in the bulk that has a, whose momentum is null from the bulk viewpoint because of the radial momentum it's going to have. So it's going, so it's following a null geodesic into the bulk. And, if you're in an excited state, you don't really know where this geodesic is going to go, but what you control is how it starts. So you're shooting in some definite way into the bulk. Okay? And, and yeah. When you actually, like, so what does it look like? And, and for this act, for this, uh, this sort of experiment, actually, what you find is that you don't, you don't really see anything generically, and you see a lot of, the, most of the signal is peak on the light cones from, on X. And essentially, you see an expanding shell of energy. So, so this is this thing, and people are studying this in, 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 in vacuum or in, in thermal states. You can boost this thing, describe jets. You can do a lot of interesting things with this. Uh, and for, for later in the talk, notice that effectively what we've done here, we've taken this orbital product OO and replaced it by one null geodesic into the bulk. So with two orbitals, we can create one geodesic. And yeah, so, so that that's the basic measurement. So here you see it's it's very it's a bit asymmetric because we we can work very hard to create a point particle into the bulk, which is kind of an amazing thing to do, but then we look at it with a very crappy camera. <laughs> that's that's just that doesn't give us a usable image. So now we're going to improve the camera part. I'm going to describe two improvements of the camp, two different designs. The first one is, is like this pioneer experiment. It's a very straightforward, physically straightforward experiment to describe. So, so here with these two O's on the outside, you create and absorb some probe, like a spacecraft you throw into the bulk. And then from some other point, you throw a, a, a pulse of light and then you record its reflection. Okay? That's, so you see you need four points to do that experiment, but you don't need more than four. Okay, that, that simple experiment. And the ideal regime, so in, 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 if, if the pulses here have high energy and follow geodesics, like the geometry you should have in your head is like you have three null geodesics. You have this uh, particle that's coming into the bulk, and then these two, these two, this two radar thing. Okay? And the signal is the following. So if I fix the point Z, it's going to be a unique point P. Well, if it crosses this geodesic, it, it's at a point P. And then the future like cone of the point P here, the wave reflects and it's the boundary around Y. So there's a, there's a hyperboloid on the boundary. That's the future like cone of P. And the signal is that for fixed Z, you get a singularity on this hyperboloid. Okay? It's very similar to the bulk point singularity. But the difference is that I folded the picture. So a bit like the pioneer experiment, like you, you can get data even if you don't recover the, the, the spacecraft. <laughs> In particular, like the spacecraft would fall into a black hole and, and, and you still get your data. <laughs> More interesting data. Okay, so that's it's very similar to, to what things have been done before, but I've changed the operator ordering, which qualitatively changed the experiment. Now we're going to do something you've never seen in an experiment, but that actually somehow seems theoretically nicer, which is an active camera. You know, like they, they, uh, in the old uh, ancient Greek days, there was this idea that the eyes was like an active device that like actively interrogated the world. <laughs> it, it, this is it. <laughs> <laughs> It's not like our real eyes, our cameras work, like you just passively record photons, but this is active. So what is it? It's an out-of-time order correlator. 
So you insert, so you, you create something in the past, but then you also create something in the future and you evolve it backward in time. And then they scatter. And then you try it, the thing that would go forward into the bulk, you evolve it backward in time to you. Okay? You need some, you need some weird mix of forward backward time evolution. So experimentally, I'm not so sure how you will measure that, but theoretically you can write that down and it's very nice. So it's out of time order correlator. And, and now the nice thing about it is that it just involves two geodesics, so it's much easier to think about. <laughs> and, and the basic signal you're looking for is the following. So, so, so you have two null geodesics, and generically in the bulk they won't intersect. If the bulk is higher dimensional, more than, uh, so now, yeah, I need a bulk that's forward, that's, that has some transverse direction. But, so then what you can do is you can tune the shooting, if you fix X and Y, you can tune the shooting angles to where you find a peak. And this peak is really telling you, you know, this, this like ray is, it's this like ray. It's telling you a lot about the geometry. So this is how you get information from this correlator. You scan over, you scan the angles until you hit the peak. Okay? So if you fix the geodesic, just, just imagine, just, just for example, concretely. So if you fix this geodesic here, X and PX, you have this blue geodesic, you have some particle that fall into the bulk. So if you scan over angle here, that's like taking a photograph. You see where the, where's the particle now? And then you evolve the time Y to a time later, you do it again, that's a movie, right? So this correlator is literally making a movie of particle moving. <laughs> yeah, so, so that's what you can do with the out of time order correlator. And you have a lot of knobs you can adjust, the shooting directions, the shooting angles, some Gaussian widths, you can play with your optics, like of course if your widths are too fat, you're just gonna see a white signal and your image will be blurry. So depending on your geometry, you may or may not be able to get a good signal, but you have a bunch of, you have some knobs that you can try to play with. Okay. It's like a camera. <laughs> so, so let's describe how we calculate. So, so there's a bunch of tools that I, I really don't have time to, 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 to go in detail in, into, but just to sketch. So basically, one, one way to think about this limit is the following. I really think of it as an OPE, but when you take Normally the OP works when the things are next to each other in the same branch. Uh, the, the operators send next to each other. Here, so if I go back one slide, for the out of time order correlator, I'm, I'm really trying to take an OP of this blue guy with the other blue guy. Of course there's the red guy between them. So, so, so what the red guy does, what the, what the reason it makes things more complicated, is that now the OP will involve non-local operators where the particle goes around the schwinger keldish contour and comes back, goes around the time fold and back. So the OP involves non-local like real operators. And, and you can describe this sort of OP in any theory, in any CFT, it's very general. And in the graphic theories, it's gonna be controlled by null geodesics that go through the bulk. And and so you have to integrate over the bulk shooting angle, and you have something like a bulk like ray here. I'm working to leading order in, in, in gravity. And to leading order in, in then you, when you take the four, for the four point correlator is like a two point function of these guys, it gives you things like this. Essentially, you have a null geodesic, another null geodesic, they interact by changing a graviton. So that's a sort of a diagram you get at that leading order. And then you can calculate this diagram and see what, what the image looks like. Uh, this one here. So the geodesic is labeled by an angle theta, uh -huh. which is what I integrated over here. Yeah. And this theta here can be anything on the future like cone of X. And, and the idea is that if you do a Fourier transform of this, by, when you Fourier transform against the wave packet, it's gonna pick out a fixed a given angle. But in position space, you have an integral over angles. So this formula is actually very similar to, to formulas that, that were obtained earlier. I will describe momentarily why. But, so I didn't really do a lot new here. But the, the general picture is that you could imagine that this, 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 this sort of OPE, the claims, is something you can do very generally. And if you go to string theory, then stringy corrections will show up by this like ray operator will become rigid trajectories instead of, 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 of just integral of, of the graviton. So, so this, this Hopefully, apparently, 
a systematic way to proceeding. And, 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 and the reason I believe this is that in, in vacuum, this correlator turns out to be exactly equivalent to something that's well studied. So, so if you're in vacuum state, you can take a four point function. And there's a so-called rigid limit when you do large boosts. And so you have a fast particle going left that interacts with a fast particle going right. And, and yeah, the, 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 the specific, yeah, the specific feature of this limit is that, uh, this point one and two here are separated by pi. So that all is x from one and at two. But if you think about this picture, I, I, I fit the picture in the point carrier patch here, but it's a bit arbitrary how you put the point carrier patch on it. So if I slide the picture half a patch northeast, I have the exact same configuration in the cylinder. So it's the exact same correlator, it's conformally equivalent. But going outside the Poincaré patch, you can also take in terms of folding the picture. So this picture is equivalent to this picture. We have a particle coming from the origin, going to infinity, and then and doing a measurement at infinity. This is like a detector and a collider experiment. So, so this is where the paper on this, uh, oh, uh, last, last, uh, last, last, last fall. And then if you shift this picture again, half a patch southwest, you get this double folded thing, which is out of time order correlator I was just describing. So, so, so you can see geometrically why all these things are equivalent in vacuum. And because we believe we understand one of these OPEs, I think we, we try rigid theory, I think we, we can apply the same machinery for all these things. In excited states, they all become different. And, and, but it's the same basic machinery. So, so now let's show some images. So, this is the simplest case when vacuum, I shoot from the origin in some direction, and then I record after some time delta t, and I make a photo, I scan over angles to make a photo. This is this photo, okay? And, and this peak here is when they hit, okay? Now just to make sure we're all on the same page, I'm gonna ask you, at least those who haven't seen the talk yet, Suppose I fix the shooting angle and I make a movie by evolving this time forward. How is this going to move? But try to answer this in your head. Okay. So keep this thing shooting, this thing shot. Yeah. See it? Exactly, because yeah, the angle part, uh, so exactly. So when you increase the time, this picture is going to get bigger and bigger but the angles don't change. The peak is gonna stay the same place. There's a fake play button. <laughs> so you have the full movie, you made the full movie in your head. <laughs> okay? So that, that's how you make, okay. And, and, and from that, you see that, that uh, yeah, nothing, nothing happened. So, so, so yeah, the bulk was very symmetrical. So there was no deflection. Particle going straight, looks straight. Now, okay, let's do an interesting state now. Sorry, no, there was an actual function Yeah, 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 so I'm plotting here the, the strength of this out of time order correlator. This is plotting a, the vacuum, so this, I'm plotting the correlator from your paper. This is like a Fourier transform. Yeah, yeah. And, and to be fully, uh, for full disclosure, uh, in, in uh, ADS3, the amplitude as kind of like, the dependence on the impact parameter is like absolute value of B. So I've taken two derivatives of it to enhance the signal. So to really see a singularity. Now let's do this for a terminal state. Actually, you don't have to do a lot of work for a terminal state because uh, it's related, a planar black hole is related by by conformal transformation. And, and before I show you movie, let, 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 let's add a little gadget. We like to see how deep the particle is. How do we see depth? There are many ways to see depth. What's one way to see depth? <laughs> yeah, you can use, Stereography, use two eyes, 
You can make two movies from slightly different points. That's what I'm going to show. Uh, another way that, that people use in astronomy is just to look at the intensity of objects. So we can also look at how the intensity vary with time. We'll do both these things shortly. But yeah, think about stereographically. So what happens in this, here's the movie you get for this thermal state. So, so, so it's the exact same setup as before. I, sh I shot a particle into the bulk. And at first, it's very close to the boundary, so, so like you, ha you really have to look at it cross eyes. Okay? And then it goes deeper into the bulk. You see like the angles get closer and closer to each other. And one over the angle is basically a measure of the depth. So you can see it's going deeper and deeper. And then you see it, it's just, if in, in vacuum EDS, it would keep getting closer and closer. But then you see it stop moving. So when it stopped getting deeper into the bulk, that, that's one sign already that it's, it, it's the horizon, the causal horizon. Okay. Oh, actually, it was not a plane or black hole. This was uh, on a circle. <laughs> At some point, you see some image. Oh, and oh, sorry, these two things are your two eyes, two different movies from different cameras. You have two cameras. Yeah, so, so yeah, one of them is, 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 is slightly skewed, so you see it moving. Yeah, the color was normalized. Uh, yeah, so let's talk about that now. The, the, the intensity changed with time. So in terms of data, what can you plot? So you can plot like the parallax, which is one over this angle separation. You can also plot the intensity at the peak. Okay, so let, let's plot those two things. So this is all kind of the raw data you get. And the intensity is kind of interesting. So at first you get some intensity goes like uh, uh, time square, which is just a signature that you have scale invariance of the of ABS. So, so from this you, record, you realize that you have an ABS geometry. And then at late times it transitions to this exponential behavior that uh, Douglas talked about uh, yesterday. Okay. So that is this Yapunov exponent, that, that's the signature of a black hole. Okay. And you can also look at the parallax and as, as, as you guess it, it gets frozen at the, at the horizon. Okay. And, and actually from those two curves you can literally like combine those two plots into a plot of the metric. This is just geometric optics, so the way, the way you do it is you make, for example, a, uh, well, you can only do it when in metrics, when you have, like, simple metrics, when you have, in, it's a geometry problem, right? You have to understand the null geodesics in, in some geometry. Given the null geodesic, we construct the geometry. And if you make an ansatz for the metric with symmetries, then, then from some geometry problem that's worked out in the paper, you can work out exactly how these, uh, how the radius is related to things you can measure, the intensity and the parallax. And, and yeah, they, actually you don't have to integrate anything, you just take derivative of your measurements and you get curves that, that, that give you the, uh, this. From Einstein equation, of course we know that A is equal to B, but we don't put that in here, this just comes out of, of, of the data. You take this different derivative of the data, you get the same curve, which is exactly the, the metric. So, so, you, so it's a very straightforward way to, to recover the metric. You don't have to solve the equation, you just have to think about null geodesics. And I'm almost done. Uh, and you can do this in any dimension. In general, the, this data that you measure from the out of time order correlator, very little measure the metric. And in fact, since we can express the metric in terms of, of the measurement, we can express Einstein equation in terms of the measurement. And this is something that's very mysterious to me. It actually takes a nice local form. So the claim is that those two equations for all time are equivalent to Einstein's equation for all radius, for all depth. I think it's very surprising that equation for all r turns into a local equation for all times. And it, we have to understand what this means from a kind of bootstrap perspective. Like if you just, I just give you four-point correlator, why would you expect these properties to be true? The, 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 the dream or the idea is that just assuming that there's a large gap in the bulk, we should be able to derive this. Yeah. Uh, Einstein equation in any thing that has translation symmetry and rotation symmetry. Yeah. Okay, but it's also, if I put something Yeah, so if you put, if you have a state with less symmetry, then I don't know that exactly where, why, when and why you'd get local equations. Okay, so I'm basically done. And here I just wanted to flash a plot from this beautiful and very prescient paper 
uh, with the analyze understood how to organize uh, the states in, in, in a strongly coupled field theory in terms of rigid trajectories from weak to strong coupling. And basically using these plots, we can, uh, uh, we can ask the question, what, what happens if you do the experiment in QCD or gauge theory as a function of the coupling? And at very strong coupling and using very good wave packets, you can get very good resolution. So, so what happens here is that I've shot a particle at straight angles to the bulk at early times. Then I'm asking at which angle am I recovering it from? Okay. The same experiment as before, but now in higher dimension. And you see with the strongly coupled theory, you actually get low, something that's local. And if the coupling is strong, but you're using crappy wave packets, you also don't get a good image. <laughs> But if the theory is weak, no matter if the theory is weakly coupled, no matter what wave packets you use, you're never going to get an image in focus. It's always going to be blurry. So this is what happens when you shoot into the bulk with a cannon that is free and tensionless. <laughs> What's happening here? <laughs> okay. So yeah, that's my summary. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> Questions? Can you say a bit more about this, like a third bullet point about the open question about the flat space limit? Like, uh, it seems like you need some very exotic observable in flat space. Not oh. the scattering amplitude. No, I think if you just, uh, suppose, suppose for example, you have a Schwarzschild black hole that's sitting in the other view space. And this resonates a bit with, uh, with, with the previous talk. So, so you can imagine scattering gravitons of it. And, and, and you can play this radar experiment with gravitons. You can play also this out of time order scattering amplitude. I think you can define it. So, so, so that's the idea. I, I think if you think about the experiments physically, I think there was nothing very special about ADS geometry about doing this experiment. But what, what is the out of time order scattering experiment? Like it, it's not. Yeah. Yeah, you have to go back to like lecture notes from the 50s when people didn't really internalize the LSZ reduction formula. They would write, you know, they were A and A dagger for in states and A and A dagger for out states, and then you put them in random orders. Oh, okay. Well, I, okay. I understand <laughs> you can define it. <laughs> I mean, conceptually, it's like you apply LSZ on the schwinger keldish contour. Uh, but, you know, they're mysterious. I think we need to understand them better. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, if you go a few uh, slides back, uh, you yeah. have an explicit equations for the metric in terms of the parallax. Yeah, yeah, these ones. Yeah. So, for example, in the first one, you have parallax and the denominator, right? So it means that uh, your yeah. geometric data you extract, it's very sensitive to an actual values of the OTOC. Is, is that right? Uh, it's very sensitive to what, sorry? It's sensitive to the actual uh, boundary data. Because, I mean, typically, yeah. whenever you do like a numerical yeah. or an actual experiment, yeah. your yeah. answer for the OTOC it will contain some small yeah. error. And yeah, I'm just yeah. wondering how much it will affect yeah, the actual bulk reconstruction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that, that is a good point, yeah. But it's not necessarily exponentially small. So th this is about, so this is a question of how well can you separate those two peaks? That, that, so the parallax that show up in the denominator is, is that question. Mm -hmm. and, and this, yeah, of course, if you fix the, 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 if you go too deep for a given wave packet, they will get blurred together. So, so yeah, it, 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 it depends on all sort of factors. I've, I've, I've not done the systematic analysis. Okay, thank you. So, uh, I just wanted to compare this with the uh, bulk cone singularities. So yes. this is something that we proposed with Mukund Rangamani and yes. Hong Liu in 2006, uh -huh. where you just take the singularity in, in a two-point function, yes. and then it's, it's sort of like microlensing. So you, you detect uh, the bulk metric simply by seeing where the endpoints of an algeodesic yeah. um, through the bulk lie, yeah. and you can extract, re-extract the bulk metric yeah. and find the horizon formation and yes. yeah. all sorts of things. So that seems a bit more stable 
yeah. than trying to diagnose yeah. a bulk by first chucking something in yeah. and then yeah, so, measuring so, things. Yeah, exactly. And there's actually a lot of interesting things you can do with two points. I, I agree with this. It's like the, the spirit of two points in the background. And, 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 and the reason here, I, where I think it becomes more stable, is especially in the horizon, I think I have a picture here that shows this, because if you imagine like this blue curve is like the probe that you're throwing into the, the horizon, and it's still possible to like bounce something off it and, and get a signal back. So, so, so it's much more stable than, 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 than trying to like, with two point function, the best you can do is like shoot sideways and then look at how it gets deflected for geodesic that kind of skim the horizon and then you know, hope that they do not, not fall. So, so I think, I think if, it just gives you more, 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 more different experiments you can do. That, that's the main difference. I see. Very good. So you, you said this has a little bit larger reach for yeah, I think, I think more restricted yeah, yeah, reach. Larger reach, yeah. And it's also something which is, from my viewpoint, nice. It has a high level of redundancy, which is nice for trying to like do bootstrap constraints on consistency condition. Because you see, for example, this point P here, you can probe from a wall null fusel light cone, a wall past light cone. You can vary X. For each of those, you can put wave packets that most of the time will miss, but it, it, you get a, a giant level of redundancy in this okay. type of experiment. Okay, thank you. Which, which I think is good. Um, can I ask, uh, let's say you have a spherical background which develops large curvature. Uh -huh. how, do, how would you see it in the camera? The large curvature? L large yeah. curvature, because I see Einstein equation. Yeah, yeah, that. yeah. Well, yeah, well, probably you would see, well, it would be, probably certainly you would see geodesics diverge maybe or, or focus, but you, you would see, you would see that when you approach this point, you get some strong deflection. That, that's one, uh, one thing you could, you could, you could see. That's one signal, for example. Yeah. Do you think you can bound it, say that it cannot happen and something should break ah, down? Ah, I see what you mean. Uh, yeah, too. Like, the goal is to study these sort of things in situations where we're not sure what to do in the bulk, right? So, so, but the answer currently is like, I, I don't know what happens close to singularity. I mean, this OTOC definitely satisfies some bounds. The, the, the difficulty is that there's a lot of mechanism for these bounds to be saturated. Like if you, if you go, if the bulk center of mass energy is bigger than Planck, maybe you just get like iconal resonation and something like this. So there's a lot of boring ways for this bound to be satisfied. So they, so the fact that the corridor is bounded doesn't necessarily tell you that singularities can't exist, right? So, so yeah, well, one, one would have to analyze these situations. And, and the second question, uh, I haven't quite understood. Do you have a prediction for the, say, behavior of the Regge intercept as a function of temperature? For example, let's say we have a conformal Regge theory in the vacuum, yeah. and I would like to ask yes. you this. Yeah. I have a prediction which actually was it's, it, it's far from clear how it fits with what uh, Douglas was, was saying, but my prediction is that the analog of these formulas for this uh, folded OPE, let me try to distinguish two things. Uh, okay, I think it, it's best here. So, so the claim that when you take this delta x to zero here, you can do an OPE in terms of some Regge trajectories, which are some function delta of j, okay? Of j or delta. The claim, is that these functions are state independent because locally our light cones look the same. Okay, this is a strong claim. The claim is that this OP is state independent. The thing that would be dependent is that if you ask for the time dependence as you increase the time separation, so things that involve like products of these operators, this I don't, you don't control from symmetries. But the dependence on, on small delta x, I believe should be state independent. That's a prediction. So the, you don't, the, if I map to Lapunov exponent and Regit intercept, this could be different. Yeah. Or, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if I understand correctly. So the, the way you can get the metric is if uh -huh. the null geodesic can reach that point. So if, if, you, have a, if you have a space time which is geodesically uh, incomplete, like if, I mean, if, if you cannot reach a certain region in space time, you cannot, you cannot get it, right, from your yeah. auto. Yeah, indeed. So, 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 so to reach a point using this sort of idea, you need the point to be connected. It's past like cone, it's like the boundary somewhere, and this future like cone also should intersect somewhere. 
that's the minimum you need. Right. Uh, yeah. This is if you use physical correlator. So I, I, I think a general message is that you know humanity has explored four point functions since forever, but we haven't yet explored everything. The, these two designs that I described today are just two things you can do that that use like legal correlation functions with real things. But maybe you know if you analytic continue to some other mm -hmm. sheet, maybe you can look into forbidden regions. I think I think there's a lot of ex unexplored things that should be explored. Okay. But certainly with legal correlation functions, if you respect the law, you, you cannot probe behind horizons. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I was not just saying horizons, yeah. just yeah, saying yeah, regions. Generally, that, yeah, yeah, you need a point that's both yeah. that's connected in both past and right. yeah, future yeah. and past like only have to intersect at least some one point. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So first let me ask you a technical question. So we had this super nice picture of coupling and uh, Parameters of your camera. So, what's the actual computation behind this? So, what for? Yeah. So, so for most of those here, what I took is let me be a bit more precise. So, I could use a conformal rigid theory, but I what equivalently I use a formula for the bulk point paper, and and what and, and the idea is that okay, I think I have the formulas. So maybe you would recognize this formula, so I will flash them quickly. So, this is like formulas from conformal rigid theory, and and there's a factor here that's basically the bulk amplitude. So I, I took this and I put Vera Soro Shapiro there. So that's what I do at strong coupling. And at weak coupling, I use the formula from your papers. I see you use this. OK, thank you. And the, now the question like from an experiment. If I'm an experimentalist, what should I do to actually do this measurement? Well, I, 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 well the one you will do is like the radar one. I, I think that this is like relatively straightforward. You, you, you put an X station and then you send a pulse. I think this one is very straightforward to define experimentally. Uh, the OT will see it and they don't forget it. Like, <laughs> don't even try to, <laughs> to measure that. <laughs> but as far as I'm, I know, I, I don't know a good way to do that. Thanks. But yeah, I suppose you had a candidate photographic system that you could play with in the lab, then I, I think that this radar experiment like it, it would, would be like one target that seems clearly interesting. Thank you. I don't see any other question, so I suggest we thank Simone, but also all the other speakers of the conference.